What's up, guys? This is Pedro from My Stuttering Life, where you will hear the good, the bad, the very ugly. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry. But through it all, just know that you are not alone. So let's get started. This is episode number 72. And my special guest is Mike Wilson. Mike Wilson is originally from Atlanta, Georgia. He is married with four kids between the ages of three and ten and currently lives in Syracuse, New York. He is a dentist and is the founder and owner of five dental practices in upstate New York. His hobbies include playing basketball, reading history, and listening to podcasts. I am honored to have him as a guest with me on the My Stuttering Life podcast. Welcome, Mike Wilson. Uh, thanks for having me, Pedro. I am looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. We have a lot of topics to cover, so let's get started. Sounds good. Do you remember when you first began to stutter? So I think the first memories the, that I personally have of being aware of the fact that I stuttered was probably being made fun of in maybe the f fourth grade or so. What my parents tell me, I started stuttering at least k kind of the buh -buh bouncing on whoa, whoa words, the, the, that's a sort of thing from the time I started talking, but I don't remember being conscious of it uh, until much later. Does it run in the family? Do you have other family members who stutter? So I don't know of any older f family members that I've ever uh, heard of, but uh, I have a first cousin with a pretty mild stutter, uh, I would say. Um, he's a stand-up co comedian, so it's... Uh, it hasn't held him back too much in life, but he does have one. Okay, how cool. He is a st a stuttering comedian. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's pretty, he gets kind of in character, so to speak, when he's doing his co comedy routine. So you don't see it much. And he does have a, a way to deal with it when it does co come up, you know, age uh, joke about him having a uh, stutter that he throws in there when when it's coming up and he feels like he n needs to sell the audience what's going on but but I think he's really confident on stage so it uh, doesn't come up much all right how cool now d during your school years had you ever had speech therapy and was it helpful yes i started going to speech therapy, I think, when I was five or six. So even before I was aware that I had a stutter, I was g g going to speech therapy. Uh, I don't remember those earliest th therapy or therapies. Uh, I probably remember it at first, maybe in the th third or fourth grade. And I went to various types of therapy the rest of my ch childhood. Do you think looking back, was it helpful or did it not have an, an impact at all? That's right. Sorry, I f forgot that part of the question. Um, oh, no, no. Yeah. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. We're just having a conversation. <laughs> right, right. So I did not find it v very helpful. Um, the techniques always, and this carried over into adulthood also, the techniques always... Uh, seemed to work pretty well in the comfortable confines with the super friendly therapist who's your whole relationship revolved around your speech and she was always so nice and I mean they were always so nice and then I would walk out of the room and like I said I don't remember when I was f five or six that early stuff I have no recollection of really but Maybe in third, I don't know, maybe fourth or fifth grade, I remember some of the therapy I went to. And from then all the way into uh, deep into adulthood, nothing ever worked outside of the therapy room very well. It would always f fall apart. And it was always like, God, I'm, uh, I'm screwing up again. I'm not 
executing the technique like the therapist is to telling me no, I should be able to. So that was always pretty frustrating. Now, in in high school, um, as you know, it's rough for a lot of people. But um, if you have a stutter, it's like a thousand times more rough, or as we say in Texas, rougher. How was your high school um, experience as a st st stutterer? It was rough. <laughs> so my, my freshman year of high school, uh, I was supposed to give a speech on Genghis Khan in history class. And from the time I heard I was going to have to get, give the speech, I was living in dread. And the day comes and I get up there and I say, G Genghis Khan was, and I couldn't get born out to save my life. And in those days, I preferred silent blocking to any kind of noisy stuttering. Uh, I just thought it, I didn't want any people to hear me stuttering, essentially. So I sat up there and facial contorted, silent blocking for probably two minutes and couldn't get out born, couldn't even get a sound out. And then I sat down in shame. I mean, it felt like an hour I was up there. And then a couple months later, uh, I had to give a presentation on a, an invention in science class, and I, going into it, I was like, man, I got, got to do something different than the Genghis Khan speech, because that one didn't work out very well. So I said, you know, the only thing I know I can say is, you know, the filler phrase, you know. And so I was like, if I get up there, you know, when I get up there and, and I'm going to have a problem, just say, you know, and hopefully that'll break the word free. So I probably ended up saying, you know, four, I don't know, three or 400 times in that 15 minute presentation. This is the, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, like 10, you knows in a row. And so then fast forward to senior year, neither of my only two friends happened to be in my lunch period. So rather than find another table where I wasn't comfortable to talking to anybody, I brought my lunch into the bathroom stall my entire senior year for the lunch hour. So literally hiding in the bathroom. So that's a quick summary of my high school jo joys with stuttering. Well, Mike Wilson, I think we had the exact same experience because presentations were just, I mean, I did it one time and it was horrible. And so the next time I would always go to the restroom because I just, you know, I wasn't able to do it. And in the lunch hour, I either ate in the janitor's closet because it was very clean. And I also ate behind the building where, you know, nobody was because nobody won, you know, wanted to, you know, hang around the kid who couldn't talk, you know, who, who would make all these facial expressions and, you know, facial tics and jerking and whatnot. So I'm, you know, I, I was in the exact same boat that, that you were in, in high school. So, uh, I think there's probably a lot of people, many millions of people around the world that have had similar experiences in high school and were, it turned us into serial avoiders, right? Because those situations were painful and difficult and and I think that's probably uh, let some of the stuff that were that were uh, that were a part of us being people that stuttered that we had this big big uh, fear of stuttering in front of people and in childhood it taught us to kind of be like that at least those few people that were j jerks to us over childhood. I don't know. Do you have that? I know it's your podcast, but do you have that type of thing too you can remember first names and last names of the kids that were worse to you growing up probably about the stutter 
Oh yes, sir. I know who the who the bullies were. And going back to your previous st- statement of you know avoidance, um, the uh, um after that first presentation, the the first two days of school, I purposely missed all through school, all through junior high, all through high school, even in college, and and um. I'm in. I'm un. I'm undergraduate, and and then also graduate school. I always miss the first two days because, as you know, you have you you have to stand up and give a presentation. You know who you are, and then in college, what's your major? And and fear is a powerful, powerful emotion that just had complete control of 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 my life during that time period. And so, you know, I, I mean, I avoided every single situation that had me to speak out loud. So I know exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, it was a miserable existence. So I'm glad we're going to get to the later parts to the <laughs> podcast. <'cause> you... <laughs> yes, we are. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you have any advice for parents and teachers with regards to children who stutter? So in the last couple of years since getting really uh, involved in some of the stuttering support groups, uh, I've gotten to know a lot of people who stutter. So for the first time, I'm hearing a bunch of different stories, right? How different people, uh, just different experiences that everybody had. And the coolest thing I ever heard, which would be, to answer your question, my advice on this, would be to handle it like this mom handled it. It's a reporter. I forget her name. She might be a good one to get on your podcast. I've got her number. Uh, She lives in Sweden. And so she, what her mom had her do, she was, I think, six years old, first day of school. Her mom had a conversation with her, said, you know, honey, you're... A person that stutters, you have a stutter, that's a part of you. And what I want you to do on the first day of school is go in there, get everybody's attention, and announce to them that you have a stutter, but that they just need to sit there and listen. The words will come out. It's no big deal. And this reporter, she's like in her 40s now, and, you know, reporter, she still has a stutter um, for sure. And, and she said... She asks questions, you know, to important people and stutters away, and and she's been okay with it her whole life. And I think it's because of how her mom handled it. Honey, go in there, tell the world you have a stutter, be honest, don't avoid. All the nice people will be fine to you. There might be a couple mean ones, but, you know, they're not who you want to be friends any with anyway. So that's the coolest thing I ever heard a parent did. And, and I don't blame other parents for not doing that because how would you, you know, to do that? Most parents are trying to help their child, of course, by trying to fix them like you would any condition your child has, but that backfires with stuttering, I think. Uh, So that's my, my thought on that. Well, you, you hit it right on the nose be 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 because that's what i do now i tell everybody um the uh, postal worker the person at the grocery store i mean i tell everybody now had i done that at the beginning oh my gosh i i believe it would have been easier but you know you will always have those mean kids but you know on the whole i believe that i wouldn't have had such a rough school life. So I I agree a thousand percent it's important to just dis disclose that you have a stutter. That way everybody knows because it's all about education. The more you know, the better that that you get. So I I mean yeah I that mom is awesome. So yeah I would love to talk to her. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll remind me after the interview and I'll well I'll reach out to her and see if she She's cool with it, but please remind me if I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now, 
job wise, had you ever experienced discrimination because of your stutter? So I'm a dentist, and I would say, as a dentist, no. I could get jobs before I started my own practice, and then, you know, there's nobody to discriminate against me. Uh, from an employment standpoint, once you own your own business. But in school, at times, I definitely felt, well, two specific experiences. Senior year of college, when you're doing the mock, you know, practice to dental school interviews, or what you do with your science professors, they do it for medical school and, I don't know, maybe law school, maybe other p professions do practice interviews. And I remember one of the professors leaning forward at the start of the interview and saying, now, Michael, you know, as a dentist, you're going to have to talk to people. He kind of looked at me and paused, you know, and I knew what he was getting at. Look, you got this stutter. Maybe you don't want to go into a profession where you have to talk to people. And I said, thanks for telling me. Now, let's continue with the interview. And then in my residency after dental school, my residency program, uh, I was planning on starting my own practice just as soon as the b bank would loan me the money and I could do it. And so I was asking questions to one of the attending doctors, you know, one of the teachers essentially at the residency uh, about how to get my practice started. And he said, now Michael, you know, as an owner, you're not just going to have to talk to patients. You're going to have to talk to staff. You're going to have to talk to vendors. It's a lot of talking. And I said, thanks for letting me know, Doc. You know, let's keep on, you know, if you can answer the those questions I'm asking. <laughs> um, so I definitely felt from certain people, and they were well-meaning. Once again, they were uh, well-meaning. You know, hey, stuttering is a struggle for you, kid kid maybe go in a direction where you d don't have to, to talk that much. So I certainly felt a sort of low expect, some people had lower uh, expectations of me because I had the stutter. And to be honest, Pedro, I kind of, I didn't realize it's this uh, uh, until the last couple of years, but I honestly used that as b bulletin board material to borrow a sports analogy, uh, I used it as motivation. Certain people d doubt whether the stutter is going to, they think the stutter might prevent me from achieving s certain things. Let's prove them wrong. And I kind of used it as a motivator, I think. And I went in that extreme direction. Like when I g graduated dental school, my plan was to have to build a dental empire where there were at least 1,000 dentists working for me. So I kind of went to an extreme ambition, perhaps because of the, you know, when I psychoanalyzed myself in retrospect, maybe I was to, trying to prove the world, you know, <laughs> in a really strong way. And I ended up getting to 30 dentists, not to 1,000. And I realized running a business is kind of a pain in the rear end um, for various reasons, for fluent people too. And so, so I moderated the empire goal and just once I had kids too, I got more focused on fa family. But So no, I, I never directly experienced that, but I think a part of why I ch chose dentistry, I know it was in fact, uh, I didn't want to put my destiny in other people's hands because I thought I might be up, probably I'll be up for a promotion at some point. So will some other guy or gal, all other things might be equal, uh, other than the fact that I have a stutter, uh, I don't want to give the world that opportunity to, to, to discriminate. I'm going to become a doctor and then own my own thing. So, sorry, long answer to your question. Oh, no, sir, it's all good. It's all good. Going back to your previous point, you know, it, it is a good motivator because I've had a lot of people tell me that I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that because I had a stutter or, you know, have a stutter. And so, you know, I just told them, watch me. 
And every single time I proved th them wrong and it, you know, made me learn that I can do anything. I can do anything if I put my mind to it, have, have a positive mindset. I mean, I can just rock it out. So just watch me. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And I think people that stutter may, I don't know if there's large statistics, you know, like uh, larger society statistics on this or worldwide, but it seems like a lot of people that stutter are uh, pretty successful, pretty educated, and perhaps, well, we, we in many cases didn't spend as much time sort of yapping, just talking, you know, maybe partying, <laughs> chasing girls or guys, <laughs> whatever the case may be, you know, we've spent more time reading and developing our m mind and studying perhaps. I don't, it's just a pet theory. I'm not sure if it's applies across society or not, but it seems that way. That is extremely correct because we have to work five times harder than in, than everybody else. That's what I realized that, you know, I, I have to practice, you know, I, I mean, I, every single day I read out loud and then I practice in front of my bathroom mirror, which I know, you know, a, a lot of people don't do, but for me as a stutterer, I have to just work a little bit harder. That way I can reach the you know, same goals. So, yes, we are hard workers <laughs> and creative and resourceful. <laughs> We're all that. <laughs> T totally. There's a, there's something to be said, you know, and this, this isn't just true of stuttering. I think other ch challenges in life can make people uh, sort of raise their games in other aspects. And it's perhaps human nature trying to, uh, you know, trying to make sure that uh, we still can can get the things out of life that we want to get out of life, you know. And we can't just smooth talk our way th through it, at least not historically in most cases. So we have to make sure we know our stuff, for example. Make sure that we prove it on the test that we know our stuff, even if, you know, people might have gotten the impression that we d did not when we were to trying to explain it. You are correct. I agree with you. Yes, sir. Now, have you ever experienced depression because of your stutter? And if you had, did you ever seek treatment for it? I would say, so I was never, I have never sought treatment for it. So there's never been a, any kind of diagnosis. Um, in high school, I was definitely de depressed though. And Less so in middle school, but it was starting a little bit in middle school. But yeah, in, in high school, I remember, for example, riding the bus in the morning, wishing that I was my dog so that I could just be home and lay around and and not have to deal with stuttering. And also, I always had a sense that if I didn't have the stutter, that, well, especially in high school, I had it, that my potential was so th thwarted by this speech impediment and I definitely remember I mean I honestly Pedro I had depressed or uh, suicidal thoughts in high school as well I don't think I would have ever pulled the trigger I never got close to you know to actually doing that but I certainly would have pre preferred to just not be alive and not be dealing with it on many days so yeah, I, I had it in high school and it turned around pretty quickly in college and we can get to that um, story whenever you want to, but um, I kind of found the superpower against stuttering to depression later. Yeah, you know, I mean, thinking back on on my school days, you know, in junior high, um, my, you know, freshman year, um, I was in a really dark place. I mean, it was, you know, n nothing was going right. And, you know, I didn't have any f friends and, 
you know, during, you know, pep rallies, I would just come home, you know, I mean, it, uh, it reached a point where I was in a really dark, dark place. And, you know, I don't talk about this much, but, um, you know, there was one night, you know, I, I told myself, that's it. You know, I'm, 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 I'm pretty much done. And I grabbed my dad's gun and, and I, I walked out of the house. I think it was like after midnight. And so I walked down the long road, just, you know, thinking about, I'm basically done. You know, my life at that point was hell on earth. And so I went under the overpass and I was just, um, I was ready. I was ready. And there was this homeless man who, um, you know, I never noticed him before, you know, driving down that road, you know, constantly, you know, at um, all hours. I never noticed any homeless person there. But on that night, there was a homeless person and he approached me and asked, what was I doing? And I told him that I was done, that, you know, no one can understand me. Um, my grades are failing because I can't do presentations. You know, um, I don't have any friends. I don't, I don't, I don't have anything. And so he told me that what I was about to do is never the answer. And he told me that we're all here on this earth for a reason. We all have a purpose. We just, you know, we just have to find it. And, you know, he told me that we are, we are all special. So I'm hearing this from a man I have n never seen bef be before. I don't know. I mean, my family tells me, um, you know, that, I'm sorry, hold on. Ooh, um, maybe it was, you know, divine intervention. I don't know what you believe in, but my family was t t telling me that, you know, things happen for a reason. And I turned around. Um, I went back home um, and um, I, pu I put the gun back and, uh, you know, and from that day onward, you know, I thought it there has to be light at the end of the tunnel. And so, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, for, you know, people who stutter, I mean, it's rough. I mean, it, I mean, people can be just outright mean and just tear you down every single day. And, you know, it reaches a point where, you know, it's like, you know, how much, how much more can I take, you know, until I have that breaking point. But, you know, if it hadn't been for that man, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be, 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 be here. And, and so I'm glad that I didn't do it. And life got better. It took me a while, but, you know, it got better. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, I, I don't think non- stutterers understand the the daily or the hourly or you know minute by minute st struggles that we that we that we go through in life doing the most simplest things you know that that a mother non stutters can do without even flinching but for us you know it just takes a little longer yeah, well, that's a. Uh, thanks for sharing that story. I mean, it's harrowing, but it really illustrates, you know, the way a lot of us feel. Uh, and it, at that stage of life, it can be really, really tough. And in my case, that was the most difficult stage. Um, and so for me, what what got me out of that stage? And I, I mean, I felt like you felt, I didn't, uh, you know, 
I didn't know if my dad even had a gun and if so, where it was. But I certainly felt like that's what I would have wanted to do. Um, I was I was brought up Catholic, so I wasn't sure if I'd burn in hell forever if I did something like that, which sounded even worse. <laughs> um, so that perhaps kept me in check from, from uh, going further. But that's, I mean, that homeless gentleman really did a... Uh, a hell of a thing there. And so that's pretty cool. He did, sir. I mean, just changed my life. He changed my life. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let me ask you this. Um, you know, I believe I'm, I'm a little older than you are. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> there was this yeah, 43. So, <laughs> well, I'm 49, 49, but, but I feel like I'm 12. So, you know, it's all good. Um, there, there was a a Amadeus um, artist. Um, her name is Gloria uh, 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 Miss Stefan, and 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 so she had a hit. The rhythm is gonna get you. So as a stutterer, <laughs> the rhythm gets to Pedro because whenever I have a block, you know, I'm tapping my leg, I'm tapping my foot, I'm tapping my my face. I'm just moving my arms all over the place to help me get over the block. Have you ever tried that? Or, I mean, do you do you do that also? So I, I have tried things like that uh, over the years. And my experience always was, and seemingly the experience that quite a few other p people that stutter I've talked to have said they have also is that it oftentimes works for a while, but then it stops working. Um, and sometimes we're left, what's left behind is a habit of, you know, say tapping our leg as we talk, but it's no longer getting the words out. And sometimes it's possible to accumulate um, where people, you know, and one of them that I had for, for a long time, really up until still a couple years ago was trying to force the word out with me for like you're lifting weights with your face but I did uh, I tried to keep it not have additional things that I was doing because uh, in my experience those things f would fail work would stop working relatively shortly and I think perhaps they were ju just at least for me they were a distraction in the moment to sort of take my mind away from um, trying so damn hard to get that word out. It would distract me and it would kind of release the word, I think is why those sort of uh, tricks eh, helped me out for a little while. But then they would stop working because they wouldn't just, they, I guess they wouldn't be as di distracting after they started to become a habit. And then you're just back with your, or I was just back with my stutter, stuttering moment, wondering what the hell is going to make this word come out. <laughs> I am in the same boat. <laughs> Let me tell you, um, we have a lot of tools in our you know toolbox to help us get the word out. And so if one tool doesn't work, I will quickly change to another tool. And, you know, there... There have been times where I have used an accent. Granted, I am from Texas. And so if I have a block, you know, I'll just come out w w with a British accent or <laughs> or some other accent to help me get the word out. Because, you know, in my mind, I have to try everything and anything to get the word out. And so, you know, I have a lot of tools in my tool belt. And so I'll just pick one. And if that doesn't work, I'll go to the next one. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you wonder, right, why would an accent work so well? I mean, it's, you know, it's not changing our physiology, you know, physiology, right? It's, it's still speech is speech, but do you think it's just because it's a distraction? We're focused on executing that deep accent or the, I can't even do, I'm not the, <laughs> very good at accents. So don't ask me to do a, but 
<laughs> British accent, but it's it's getting our mind in a different framework where we're an actor executing a an accent rather than just us trying to get get a word out. Right. It for for me it is a distraction because in high school um I was in the drama club. They welcomed m- me in and so you know people were telling me, you know, how can you be in drama because you have a st- st- a stutter. But what I found out is these drama kids I mean, they were like super positive and always pumped up, always, always positive, nurturing. And they told me that I could do anything. And so one day there was a meeting. Uh, our high school was going to do a play, the the Wizard of Oz. And they asked me, would, would I play the lion? And so I thought, yeah, that'd be awesome. And then on my way home, I thought, what have I done? <laughs> What what did you do, Pedro? And so I uh, rehearsed the lines multiple times f- for a whole month. I mean, I-, I had them down pat. And so on the um, opening night, I didn't have the fear. I mean, because I wasn't Pedro. I was the lion. And the lion didn't stutter. And so I went out there, I did all my lines. And I mean, I could see the people in the audience with their mouths open, <laughs> thinking how, I mean, what in the world? Be, be, because they knew that, that um, I stuttered. And so when the play was over, and I was Pedro again, guess what? <laughs> so did the stutter. <laughs> <laughs> it, so being distracted um, to help me get the word out, you know, that has proven a helpful t- tool mm. for me. And in the case of an accent, because uh, you probably couldn't have just gone out there and tapped your leg, your way to control over your speech during that, right? You were actually talking like the lion talked, like your lion character talked, right? And so you were actually exerting kind of a proactive control over your voice modulation, your rhythm, your everything, because you're not you, you're the lion. You got to get out there and be the lion. And so it was almost uh, stuttering went by the wayside because you were dialed into properly executing the lion. And that means controlling, you know, um, your voice in a different way than you usually would try to. But it's, and there's this phenomenon that people have noticed for a really long time. And many of us people that stutter have noticed it. When we sing, we don't stutter. Most people don't. I guess Mel Tillis was the... most famous example of that, the old school singer. And, you know, I know science has theorized that it's because singing apparently happens in one part of your brain and speaking in another. But I, th- I think I might have a different theory and it would, it would dovetail more in with why people that stutter l- lose their stutter when they go into character, when they go into an accent which is not singing, right? I mean, you weren't singing the whole time you were the lion, right? And it's that when you're singing, there's a proactive control. You're controlling your voice, you know, that sort of thing, right? You're not just hoping the words come out. You're seizing control of that whole apparatus that's producing this sound or the sound of the character in the case of the lion. So that's my theory. I don't, it would, because the losing the stutter when you're in character speaking wouldn't make sense in that context of, oh, we, you know, that right brain, left brain thing that is theorized for why we don't stutter when we sing wouldn't make any sense when we speak in character because we're still speaking, not singing. Right. I mean, you 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 are um, absolutely correct and you know many people have asked me don't talk to me sing to me I said, no you don't want to hear me sing <laughs> i can't really carry a tune it's not lovely no <laughs> so <laughs> okay let me ask you this so what is your most 
effective technique that you do to help you with your fluency? So it's one that I came across a couple of years ago, and it basically combines a breathing technique, breathing control. And I had had some success going way back to the middle of high school. There was a somewhat glorious period in the middle of high school where I got, got control of my speech. And, but it didn't last. I thought I was cured. Uh, I thought I was over it. And it didn't last, but uh, I had been doing, so after the Genghis Khan speech and the, you know, speech, that I mentioned in freshman year, I got trained on a breathing technique, which was more b belly breathing. They strapped up a sensor around my belly and you could see it on the computer. You could see your inhalation and your exhalation like a wave on the computer. And I that combined with some confidence things that happened there, I got a lot, in a lot of control. Uh, I then lost it within a few months I stopped going to the breathing thing and basically the stutter fully came back by senior year. But fast forward 23 years or whatever to a couple of years ago and I started doing a breathing technique. I was trained in a breathing technique, uh, costal breathing, which is one that there's a few programs around the world, I guess, that that use costal breathing. Um, the McGuire program is where I got that training. There's another one called Starfish over in Ireland or the UK. And another one called the De Del Ferro method, I think, in the Netherlands. Um, and I think it originated with Del Ferro, I believe, in the Netherlands. He was an uh, opera singer who, my understanding of the story is that he's a pretty famous opera singer, I guess, but back in his day in the Netherlands, and I think he died maybe 30 years ago, but he started this uh, speech program in the 1970s in the Netherlands for, for people that stutter. And apparently this is how he would breathe for opera singing. So I've never done opera singing, but it looks like you would need a lot of air, right? <laughs> to belt it out. And so he trained himself. Yes, you this, do. <laughs> uh, right. And so I don't, I don't know the whole details, but my understanding, what somebody told me on this part of it is that maybe he was dating a girl with a stutter and noticed that she seemed like she was out of breath and said, hey, maybe try my uh, opera breathing technique that I've c come up with. I don't know if, if he invented that or was, was taught that, but he was not a person that stutters. But anyway, he came up with this costal breathing thing, which essentially is how you breathe wh when you yawn. Like you ever wonder why when you yawn, you, you feel so different all of a sudden, right? Like what changed in that yawn? Well, we got our mouth open wide. We inhaled an eh, insane amount of air. And when we do that, we take a costal breath. And so the word costal literally means of the ribs. Uh, and so it's a rib expansion. It's a big chest expansion breath, and it's a very powerful way to breathe. That co combined with basically being di disfluent on purpose. So part of this technique is to stretch out so some sounds like I'm exaggerating more right now. And also to start some words and then pa pause, like I'm doing right here, where you ha hear me start and then pa pause and then say the word. And also something called assertive first sound. So I was trained on easy onset. Almost all the speech therapies, most of them in the, the U.S. that I've done were easy onset training. I did the Hollins technique uh, in Roanoke, Virginia, which is one of the better ones I had, I would say. I did that when I was 18. But once again, it fell apart in the real world. And so with this technique, it's assertive first sound. So it's the opposite of easy onset. So easy onset is, hey, stutter, you're 
your tense, you know, just ease your way into the word, right? My name is Mike Wilson. Barely articulate that sound, you know? And whereas assertive first sound, it's attack that first sound. No holding back, you know, stuttering. Uh, as the theory goes with this, stuttering is a form of holding back. We never forgot how to speak. When we're alone, most of us can speak without stuttering, or at least are much more mild. And so we never forgot how to speak, but we're holding back for whatever reason in those moments. Probably this fear-based learning going all the way back to childhood, those, you know, really tough experiences the, that we had. So those are, that's the main part of this technique. And I've, I've modified it a little bit on myself as far as the way that I pay attention to, to my breathing. Um, uh, I try to pause at the bottom of my breath so that I then really need a big breath. And when the speaking time comes, I'm sort of sitting in that, what I call the crouching tiger position where I've released my air and I'm sitting there ready to take a huge breath I decide to speak, take that gargantuan breath, and then hit that word assertively right at the top of the breath. So that's what's worked for me more than anything in the past that I've done. And another part of it, though, is assertively to taking it out to the world. So going to the mall, speaking with, you know, 25, 50, 100 people, and strangers are usually more difficult for p people that stutter. So you just kind of attack the, the fear. And that, you know, doing that combination of things and trying to really become a Jedi master of the breathing um, has all been way more beneficial the, than anything ever was that I tried before. So that was a long, another long answer to your question, Pedro. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, that's fascinating because we actually trained on the same apparatus. They um, called it the um, cafe s system where they had this uh, coil that went around your belly that m that monitored your breath. And then on the screen, when they would tell you to inhale, there would be a dot forming a line going up like on on a mountain you know you know um, this huge arc then i'm um, at the top they tell you to begin speaking and so when i would inhale and then on the exhale i'm going to speak and there are no blocks because the air is fluid and very fluent now it makes me sound like a robot. So, you know, I had to um, practice it. And so that way I don't sound so robotic. But um, I've been through so many techniques and then also trainings. And so for me, when doing hypnosis, the uh, therapist taught me diaphragmatic breathing. And so I've been using... Uh, that um, to help me out. So, I mean, there are many trainings and many programs. And so, you know, if they can help you, fantastic. Yeah, and you're right. There's so many different uh, approaches to this. There's no consensus amongst the experts at all as to what's the b best way to go about it. Um, I think in general, the success rates with adults the, that stutter um, with speech therapists is, is not, well, and I know they're doing their best, but at least something to be desired, I think, right? And that whole question of how do you bring it to the real world, right? Because a lot of these things, they work in the comfort zone, but bringing it to the real world, so to speak. And stuttering is a strange condition, right? The more usually the more at risk or the higher risk the situation directly correlates with how badly we want not to stutter. 
a lot of times, right? So when you're trying to impress somebody when you're in a job interview or, you know, maybe and this one varies, but for a lot of us, including me, for a long time, when you're talking to somebody of the opposite sex that you're trying to impress, you know, it's, it would get even more challenging the more you wanted not to stutter. And so that's kind of the million dollar question is how do you get these things to transfer out to, to the real world? Well, you make a great point because you are already doing it when you go out in in a, in a public and just force yourself to talk to people, you know, um, get out of your comfort zone, talking to people and practicing. When you get out of your comfort zone, that will push you to do some things that you would never do. And so when it turns out, well, that's a win. And so every time you have a win, it's building momentum for you. And so let's say, you know, it it didn't turn out too well. Well, then you learn from that and then you mo and and then you move on and you keep on doing it. I tell everybody, do not st stop if it doesn't go well. You have to keep on doing it because life will knock you down. But what you have to do is you, you have to get back up every single time. Mm -hmm. Totally. Uh, I completely agree with that. And, um, and from a f fear standpoint, the more we face this thing, I guess it's like anything. Uh, so I definitely think that there is a phobia like component to adult stuttering. And, and I, when I call it adult stuttering, I mean the stuttering like you're a person that stutters that didn't outgrow it, right? Not like the four-year-old that stutters, 80% of whom will outgrow it. I mean, the you have all those bad memories and bad experiences of struggling to speak and feeling embarrassment, shame, self-hatred, you know, all that, you know, all that iceberg stuff, right? You know, the iceberg analogy. Yes, sir, I do. Yeah. Like what people can see is the little part of the iceberg sticking above the water, all the feelings though, all, you know, and most of the iceberg, 90% of it is b below the, uh, below the surface. And that's actually coined by a guy named Joseph Sheehan, who you, who you might know of. He was, he ran the, uh, UCLA, uh, I believe it was called the Psychological Speech Clinic, and he was a person that stutters himself who would use this approach, but he founded that Psychological Speech Clinic at UCLA, I was just reading about this the other day, from like 1949 to 1983, he ran that, and he was big on this idea of going out and talking to people, because it's a... F fear-based, you know, full-on blocking where we know, like, say on our name, where, of course, we never forgot how to s say our name, but it can be one of the most challenging things for, for most people to stutter because you're supposed to know your name. It's awkward when people ask your name and you can't say it. You're like, what have you forgotten your name? All that stuff that we've all, uh, and most of us have experienced as a person that uh, stutters. So we've got all these memories wrapped up. So like any other phobia, you got to go face it repeatedly and relentlessly, right? And I think it probably takes both a physical technique of some sort. You know, there's many different ones out there. I tend to think they all might work because they all do work, at least for me in the clinic. They would all eventually work pretty well with the friendly therapist but that's got to be forced almost to the real world by going out and attacking the fear and just talking to eh, eh, anybody and everybody. And I think that's kind of the only hope. Uh, when I say hope, I mean the only hope to really get in a lot of control 
of our speech is to combine the some sort of a physical skill or technique. And I shouldn't say only because this is a variable condition amongst different people. But for a lot of it, a lot of us who it's a r- real uphill battle or was historically, it takes both non-avoidance and attacking the fear over and over again by going out and being willing to stutter. That's essentially what we're saying, right? Show the world our stutter. We have things to say. And we're not going to not say it just because we were b- born with the stutter. That would be, you know. We still have freedom of speech, even though we have a stutter. And most of the world will sit there and listen. Once they realize we're a person that stutters and that we're not done talking yet, and most people will sit there and be respectful of that. But we have to choose to speak. If we shut ourselves up, I guarantee you they're not going to hear a word we, we have to say. Or if we choose not to go to that party, because we have our stutter, well, I guarantee they're not going to, uh, you know, those folks are not going to get to hear what we have to say. So it's almost like a self-censorship thing and non-avoidance. And Sheehan was big on that, that UCLA guy. He's got one, I only found one thing f- from him on YouTube, but it's like a nine minute interview that I would yeah, encourage people to check out. Wow. Those are um great p- points that you made and going back to just one of them you know i've had a lot of people ask me you know did did i forget my name did i forget why i'm there did 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 i forget what i was going to order and so you know i mean you know if i had a quarter for uh for each time you know um i would be driving about eight or nine teslas but um <laughs> but the point being is that I took every opportunity to tell the person that, you know, I have a stutter, so it, it may take me a little bit longer. So here's what you're going to see, and here's what you're going to hear. And, you know, nine times out of ten, they were apologetic, you know, that way for the next time, they, you know, they are better prepared. But as you know, you you have you I'm always have that one person, you know, who doesn't want to be there, who doesn't really care. But, you know, I'm not focused on that one. And so, you know, um, I believe the whole key is just education. Tell them what you have. This what you're going to see. This what you're going to hear. And, you know, like you previously stated, we have a voice. We need to to get that voice out. Because if we don't, they won't hear the message. And we have a very powerful message. So I, you know, you made some awesome points there. So I am a a, a little curious. Do you go through fluency phases? Like, you know, one week you have horrible speech. The next two weeks you have awesome speech. Do you, you go through that? So it's interesting, and uh, I definitely go through ups and downs. It's not full-on horrible speech, you know, versus great speech, but I definitely go through ups and downs where sometimes my speech is more challenging than other times. It's not perfectly consistent, for sure, from day to day or even week to week, and even in, in the same situations, you know, there's some consistency where people that are totally in my comfort zone, it's almost never all that challenging now. And people that are that are not in my comfort zone, it's a little bit more challenging. So there's definitely a difference there. But even from week to week in the, those same situations, there are ebbs and flows. It, it's not a v- very consistent uh or it's not a perfectly consistent experience, for sure. And I think that's maybe one of the things that's f- frustrating for a lot of us people that stutter, is you don't know which which version of you is going to show up that day or that for that event, right? <laughs> exactly. There's uncertainty around it, and that can be annoying, and we have to develop our p- patience with our stutter, for sure. That is 
true. And so that will lead us into our next topic. And, you know, you know, this is a, a hot topic for a lot of people who stutter and, and the responses are just split right down the middle. And so let me ask you this. Do you let, um, uh, mothers finish your sentences so and there's really three stages in my life with stuttering i feel like the first one was the childhood one we talked about the third one is me these last couple of years since i got in a lot more control of my stutter but then there's the middle one from age you know 18 to 41 so from age 18 to 41, at the beginning of that, I got eye contact training. So basically I had my professor at Florida State, or my speech pathologist at Florida State University, took me around campus and made me look people in the eye when I stuttered. So we would ask him random questions and he'd, it took him probably a thousand times before I could get to the point where I could actually look look people in the eye when I stuttered. Once I did that, it turned around my psychology. So that guy hiding in the bathroom senior year in high school was now raising his hand in big lecture halls asking questions and stuttering away and looking from person to person in the eye. So it really, really changed my psychology. But my stutter was still pretty severe. You know, there's a, on my YouTube page, there's a uh, example of what my stutter was like during those years from 18 to, to 41. For those years when I was, you know, still having a lot of blocks, but I was saying what I had to say, and people, if they had a problem with it, could go hang out with somebody else. <laughs> that was my perspective. If you have a problem with my stutter, you're not the best person in the world. Get the heck out of here. Go hang out with somebody else. Never had to say it, but looking people in the eye. Uh, during those years, to answer your question, some people ask me, do you want me to f finish your sentences sometimes? And I said, well, I don't mind as long as you guess right. And so that essentially sent the message that you better damn well know what I'm going to say. <laughs> then, yes, you can finish it. You're, right. If I'm saying a cliche, like, you know, the grass is, and you know I'm going to say greener, then I don't mind. But... 99% of the time, people were not going to know what I was going to say next. So then, no thanks, because it's me talking, <laughs> not you talking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and you know, now, now I can more release my air, clear my lungs, get that intense relaxation in the chest that comes from that release of air like a sigh, keep make it, maintaining eye contact, get a big breath and, and I can usually say the word now so it's not as uh, not as pertinent of an issue as it was from age 18 to 41. Prior to age 18, like in high school, yes, I was hoping everybody would finish my sentences so I could stop talking for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I completely relate. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, so I've had these different stages of life. I, you know, I don't know. It's like different uh, reincarnations or something in this uh, same body to some extent. <laughs> okay, so here is another hot topic. And, you know, again, it's just split right down the middle. So when you are alone, can you speak without stuttering? Yes. So, uh, yes, that, that has always been true. I would occasionally have little stuttering moments when I'm alone, but for the most part, never a problem. Or talking to my dog. Like, I've had a few dogs over the years. I could talk to my dog fine. And that's why stuttering to some extent, well, I would say the number one predictor for the vast majority of people that stutter, at least that I've encountered and talked to, number one predictor of how much somebody's going to stutter is who's listening or not listening, right? Because, and I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know, but... Like, is this one split down the middle? Like, do half of people say that they stutter ju just as much when they're alone as when they're talking to people that are, say, high-stress people like authority figures or job interview or, 
whatever the case may be. The answer is yes, and I am one of those people. When I am alone, <laughs> I still stutter. When when I'm having a conversation in the shower, you know, um, as we all do, um, I still respond and I, I stutter. When I talk to my dog, R- Ruby Jean, I still stutter. So, I mean, this is just very fascinating that all of the answers are just 50 50, you know, half do and then half don't. So, you know, that's a head scratcher. And Pedro, is it just as, uh, is there any change in se- severity when you're alone or n- not alone? Or is it exactly the same? It is the same. Gotcha. Uh, well, that's, that's good in a sense because, um, because it says that your stuttering is not, I mean, very situation, right? Or is it like, are there times like in high pressure situations still, is it, is it more severe or does it just kind of not change no matter uh, who's listening? Oh, no, sir. Um, there was a book that, um, that um, I read by Mel Robbins and her book changed my life because it's titled the five second rule. And so in her book, she talks about turning your um, anxiety and turning your fear, turn that um, into a mix, um, turning it um, into a mix excitement. And so Mm. once I learned that, that was a game changer for when I gave later on, you know, professional presentations in huge auditoriums, talking to medical professionals, doctors, nurses, you know, and whatnot. The moment I walked on stage, no more fear, no more anxiety. I was thrilled. I could not wait to hop on stage. I could not wait to tell them my name. And then I also had a a really good icebreaker. I would tell them, I'm Pedro Pena. I have a speech impediment. Um, And so if I get hung up on a word, give me four hours and they'll, and the word will come out. And so many will laugh with me. And so that breaks the ice. They know what I have. And so then I just go on with the presentation. So to, to, you know, go back to your question, it is not situational. Gotcha. Well, that's, um, and I know, supposed to be you asking questions and me answering, but I'm curious, and I don't know if you've talked about this in the past, but did you get, uh, have you had times when you were, you know, basically in control of your speech in the therapy setting, but then it wouldn't transfer out, or did you never get control in the therapy setting? I never had control. Gotcha. And that um, was a big factor. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's... It really is an interesting and variable co- condition, right? From person to person. It's uh, and, and that probably makes it hard to cut the speech therapists and researchers some slack. That p- probably makes it really tough for them to figure out what the heck is going on when it's so v- variable from person to person. And, you know, it, it's a challenging, uh, challenging thing. See, and you bring up a, a g- great point Because we are all different in our journeys. Um, We do have a common bond. We all stutter. And so I talk to people from around the globe, you know, from Australia, from the Netherlands, from Germany, from Canada, um, Mexico. And they all, their journeys, I mean, it's just so different for each of them, although we all have the same fears, we have all had, you know, traumatic school um, events and life um, events. But in, you know, talking to these amazing people and courageous people like yourself, there's a common theme that we all have that courage in us. You know, we all have that power. And so to hear 
each of those people whom whom have been on my podcast talk about their journeys, talk about their courage, talk about their um, triumphs and their challenges. I mean, I am in awe of all of y'all. Y'all are just extremely courageous in your journeys. Mm. And that's a great point that you're bringing up. And I think that uh, in my experience, a huge part of a person's stuttering journey is how to get over the sense of inferiority that many of us felt in childhood around this condition. And a lot of people still feel it strongly as an adult. And I think the point that you're making there, that actually when you go through life with a a stutter, it in some sense has aspects of, well, no doubt it takes courage, especially to say what you have to say. That takes courage to be open. Be willing to stutter and to show it to people it takes courage and telling people about it, you know, disclosing takes honesty. And as far as I know, every culture on earth respects courage and honesty. Those are universal virtues that every culture tries to inculcate as much as possible in its people and So in that sense, having a stutter is an opportunity to become a hero because we've dealt with uh, something that can be very, very difficult to deal with. And to come out of that on the other side as an intact human being um, and to go out and, and live our life anyway and to be willing to speak, to have the courage to do that, it's uh, something that deserves respect. Influent people might not understand what it's like to be a person who stutters or the experience, but they can empathize if we if we tell them and we we show them and we um, we show that something like this doesn't have to stop you from from being yourself and living your life. And people can gain a lot of respect. And I felt like that, you know, when I. Uh, my stutter was more severe and going through and becoming a doctor and getting my practices started, I could tell that people had more respect for me because of my stutter probably than they would if I didn't have my stutter. Because I had overcome, I was still doing pretty good stuff despite having the speech impediment. And if I hadn't had the speech impediment, well, you know, Dr. Wilson's got it all, whatever, you know, he didn't, you know, People don't necessarily know that you earned where you're at. When you got a stutter, it's pretty obvious. Whatever you got in life, you you earned it because you had a challenge that that people can empathize would be difficult to have. Right. You are so right, sir. <laughs> so I have a another hot topic, and so dating. Dating is hard, you know, for a lot of people, but if you have a stutter, it's like a thousand times more difficult. How did you handle dating with having a stutter? Yeah, so uh, I've been married for the last uh, 11 years, so this is pre-11 years ago. It was definitely a big challenge for me. Um, For a lot of years, even after I got that eye contact training and was had developed much more courage in most aspects of life, I still was hesitant to ask girls out. And um, and there was certainly a lack of confidence there. And, you know, they just didn't know what was going on. Also, a lot of times you kind of need to impress in the first, or you feel like you need to impress in the first, you know, one or two things that you say, or you're not going to have a chance. And that adds performance pressure. And so it was a big... It was a big uh, roadblock, at least I thought it was, for a lot of years. And I wouldn't even ask girls out until really I was probably 26 or 27 years old before I started just asking girls out if I liked them. And so when, you know, when you don't ask, when you when you make no attempts, you don't show that you're interested, you're not sending out any signals. So, you, so I didn't get uh, too many dates or... I didn't have a serious girlfriend really before I was 27. And I think that was 
that was uh, very much linked with my holding back on on letting girls know that I liked them and that I wanted to take them out. And but eventually, I got to the point where I was like, "Look, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ask." And you know, and I had known that for years. Worst they can say is no, just ask. You know, it's not that big a deal. But I had that fear of rejection, and so eventually, I started asking and. Sure enough, I started getting dates when I started trying, you know, doing the thing that you got to do to get dates, which is let them know that you like them and see if they want to go out. So that was my experience with that. See, Nike has gotten it right because, you know, their their, you know, motto is just do it. And so you did it and (laughs) it worked out well. (laughs) It's amazing in life. I mean, when you finally just start making yourself do something. And keep doing it. It's amazing what you can do as opposed to holding back and sort of psyching yourself out that you can't do it and therefore you never try. Right. Yes, sir. Now, what do you think about all of this new technology? You have Google Home, you have Alexa, and then you have Siri. Do you think that this is helpful or hurtful to people who stutter? Well... It can be a huge challenge, and I have experienced that many times trying to use the voice-to-text or just communicate to the AI via speaking. And before uh, getting a lot of control of it in the last couple of years, I couldn't use those things. Like they just, they just didn't understand what I was saying, which made me think they were much more uh, stupid than humans, despite the... Uh, the hype. <laughs> See, and you know, you you bring up some great points because you know my um, SUV is voice activated, and so you know, I mean, I tried, I tried, I tried, and and you know, after thirty minutes of just sweating and your heart's hurting and your ch- chest is pounding, I just push a button. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Let's just go. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not worth the effort at some point, you know. Yes, and and so speech-wise, what is a challenge that you had to overcome and how did you do it? I would say small talk was a big challenge for a long time. And part of it is, you know, stutter, like speaking and stuttering, all the breath holding, all the kind of lifting weights with my face, all took a lot of effort. And it was exhausting. A 20-minute conversation was more tiring than to two hours of full-court basketball. So if I was going to be talking to somebody, I wanted to really make it count. And small talk where it's just, you know, niceties of, yeah, let's talk because we have to talk sort of thing. Uh, I really didn't like that. And uh, so the way I overcame that, well, one was just... Uh, well, the big way that I overcame it was learning how to take small talk from small talk to something meaningful quicker so that it's not just, oh, where, 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 you know, just back and forth sort of meaningless banter, if you will, that nobody even cares if they're in that conversation. So basically trying to take small talk from something just social niceties to a real conversation. And sometimes it would just, just be just bring up so, something deeper and see if they want to talk about it. Not stop talking to them, go talk to somebody else, <laughs> but try to get it to a meaningful conversation rather than meaningless conversation. And meaningless conversation may be not, the, you know, not that annoying for fluent speakers because it's not a struggle for them, but to struggle and have meaningless conversation was not... So, something I wanted to do. You bring up a very valid and amazing point is that many non stutterers don't understand how eggs, how eggs, eggs, how tiring (laughs) it is for, for, you know, those of us who, who stutter. I mean, it drains you physically mentally, psychologically. I mean, so, you know, I'm at the end of the day, you don't want to do nothing but sit on that couch 
and not talk to anybody and wait for the next day when when you have basically re you know re um charged because the things that we have to go through to get the word out i mean it's just physically tasking so yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and he's an example of that pedro i remember maybe five about five years ago before my grandfather died i was trying to you know get as much of his life re- recorded as i could so i i got him to sit down with for an interview with me for like four or five hours just with the tape recorder in between us or the uh, iphone as it is nowadays but uh but that was in between us and we just talked and he's 94 years old at the time and I'm, you know, 38 at the time and he could sit there and chat all day. Didn't tire him out. In fact, it energized him and he's 94 and I'm just wiped out after four or five hours of talking to him and all these, uh, you know, stuttering, breath holding, struggling through words and that it kind of got in my or it, it hit me at that point. I was like, man, speech is not really... If my 94-year-old grandfather can sit here and do it all day, obviously speech is not supposed to be like I'm struggling through it. It's not supposed to be this hard, right? If a 94-year-old can sit there and do it all day. And so that kind of set me on a path to some extent uh, of wanting to discover a technique that worked for me that made me not have to suck struggle so much and breath hold so much and uh and just be so tired and and I'm an outgoing guy as you can pu- probably tell I like to share thoughts and ideas and so I wanted to make it easier for myself less struggle so that was a an impactful moment I guess watching my 94 year old grandfather just talk away for 5 hours and not even be t- that tired at the end of it you know that is amazing that you you um d- did that and and so like what um, Oprah talks about you know having that aha moment mm. that was yours yeah how yeah. cool which leads me to what has st- what has stuttering taught you it's taught me p- patience Primarily with myself, but also with other people. You have to have p- patience with people, especially when they're new to this condition. Because most fluent people you meet have never encountered a person that stutters, at least not one that would just stutter, right? Maybe they've encountered them, but those people didn't talk. So they never knew they stuttered. And so we, we have to have patience with other people. We have to have forgiveness with other people. Like you said, people might, their snap response, their immediate response to our stutter might be that they think it's funny at first, or, you know, they have a lack of, they show a lack of patience on their face or whatever the case may be, but they really don't know what's going on usually at first. So for us to, A, be pissed at them is not only fair to them, but it makes it worse on us to go around the rest of the day being pissed off because somebody chuckled at first when we stuttered, you know? And so I would say patience and forgiveness are two big things that I had to learn, both with other people and myself. I mean, you know, forgiving myself for for uh, for wasting my own time, so to speak. Because <laughs> uh, a lot of times I want to move on. I want to get through this subject and get on to doing the next thing in my day. But you have to pa- pause and say what you got to say. So it's it's taking more of our own time, I mean, than anybody else's. And so to be patient with myself, to forgive myself for having this stutter and look, just whatever. Sit here and say, say what you got to say and roll on with the day and do it with a smile. So I think those were key things. Um, I think it's taught me empathy as well. I can empathize with people that have some condition that nobody else knows what's going on with it or it makes them different. So I think that's always a good quality to be able to feel for. And not so much like 
have sympathy for, although that's a part of it. Just learn treating other people like they're equal, even if they have something that makes them struggle in some way, whether they're in a wheelchair or or they're you know special needs in whatever way or uh, whatever the situation may be. Just to, just to be able to put yourself in other people's shoes, I think, is easier when you've had a condition yourself that makes you di- different and that makes you struggle. That's very powerful. That is, ex- I mean, that's just, you know, many of the things that you spoke about, that's what I feel um, that, that what it has taught me. And it t- took me a long while to forgive. I mean, it, I mean, it just, because, you know, I had all that anger. And so once I forgave myself first, then I had the power to do it to those other people whom, when I was speaking and had a block, they would just walk away. Mm-hmm. And so that um, that hurt. But, you know, I finally, I mean, it took me decades to learn that I need to forgive, to move on. So, yeah, we uh, share the same traits. Yeah, not to carry that anger w- with us the rest of the day, the rest of the week, the rest of our life, because um, it just makes our life worse. You know, and, and people really don't know what's going on, usually. They're not sure. They maybe think we're done talking or we're having a neurological reaction or that we're so embarrassed that we would be happier if they walked away and we didn't have to keep talking and struggling. You know, people don't know how to react. And But I did find, Pedro, that eye contact during blocks, which, like I said, it took me probably a thousand times of the therapist having to remind me not to look down, to look back at the person. Eventually I could do it. And something I found was once I started doing that, people actually figured out much quicker that I had a speech impediment because they're like, no, you know, he's, he's still with me. And the word would eventually come out and I'd move on to the next word in the sentence. And people would figure out much quicker that I stuttered um, than if I looked away and stuttered. Cause then they don't know, like, is he having a neurological reaction? Is he done talking? What's happening? You know, people really were confused, but that's something I found that, People just figured it out a lot faster when I looked at them. And also, it, it, you know, eye contact goes back even before our species, right? Um, you know, if you believe in evolution, eye contact goes back long before our species because animals make eye, eye contact is meaningful in the animal kingdom, right, in a lot of cases. And presumably before our species figured out that we could talk, we were looking at each other. So there's a lot of communication that happens, eye contact and then the rest of the face. And if we're not looking at the other person, we don't we lose all that. We don't know what expression they're making. We don't know what their eyes are doing. And there's no face-to-face communication there when we're looking away. We're like isolated in our own little world there. And so I found when I started, when I got to the point where I could look people in the eye, it really... We were then in the moment together with each other. Yes, I'm uncomfortable with my stutter at this moment, struggling, but you're right there with me. You don't know what to do either. You're uncomfortable too. We're having a moment together here. We're both human beings. We're having a moment together. We're equal. Even if I'm the one with the speech impediment, you're going to stay in there and listen to me, you know? And and I I really felt like that, and I, I don't know how to describe that. And like, that's why I brought up the fact that it goes back, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years, but there's something powerful in there. When I learned to look people in the eye, it made us equals. It made me accept myself much more. It made them accept me much more. And it really changed everything quickly. And so I'm a huge believer in hanging in there and looking people in the eye when you're blocking. Now, if it's a long, long block, and they have already figured out that you stutter and you know they're going to be patient. Listen, I'm not saying stare them down the whole block, but it, especially at first, when they're trying to figure out what the hell is going on with this guy, 
look them in the eye. They're going to figure it out much faster. And they're also getting feedback from us as to how to react. Like, look, I'm still talking to you and I expect you to stay here. And if you do walk away, you're going to be doing it to my face. Whereas if I'm looking at the floor, well, then you can maybe just slink away and, uh, <laughs> you know, and maybe I didn't even notice that sort of thing. Well, Mike, this really resonates with me because when I block, my eyes are closed. And so if they <laughs> are not vested into the conversation and they walk away, I don't know until I open up my eyes <laughs> gotcha. and notice, hey, they're gone. OK. And so I can just m m move on, you know, but. That's one thing that I really have to work on is to make that eye contact because I never do. I always close my eyes. And then when I'm having a block, I'm not breathing. And so at some point, I'm going to get dizzy. I'm going to lose consciousness. And it isn't a, a good look if you're passed out on the ground and they're calling 911. So I need to work on making that eye contact because you bring up such a valid point that that is what I have to work on. And so that way, you know, th that can be another tool that I have in my tool belt. Yeah, I totally agree um, that it's, it's, it's something that can be worked on, but it's, it's not natural. I, I, seriously doubt that I ever would have developed uh, essentially that habit. I mean, you call it ability, but that habit of doing that without that specific training where somebody made me, and literally it was time after time after time, I'd start blocking, look down. Nope. Michael, look at him. Do it again. Nope. Michael, look at him. Nope. Michael, look at him. You know, like it, it took a big, it was a heavy lift to get to that point. So, um, you know, I think, uh, I would assume it would be similar with other people that are very much in the habit of not, not doing that, but it does change the moment. It, it significantly changes the moment with people. And it, 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 uh, though it can be a little bit uncomfortable for them at first, it enables there to be more of a connection, a human connection between the two of us and an equality that's, like I said, it's hard to describe, but I would definitely uh, highly suggest that because it's a, for me, it was a g game changer. And if I, you know, you never know, we can't run our life over twice, right? So who knows where we would have been if one thing hadn't happened or another thing or another thing. But if I hadn't had that eye contact training, I, I honestly believe that I probably wouldn't have become a doctor. I wouldn't have started my own practice. I might not have gotten married, you know, had kid, I, who knows, who knows, but it, it changed my, this might sound weird to say, but it changed my soul with regards to stuttering in a very powerful way where I was no longer the hiding in the fetal position in the corner. I was then looking people in the eye, literally projecting, if you have a problem with my stutter, no worries, get the hell out of here go hang out with somebody else because you're not really the kind of person I want to hang out with, right? Like I said, I didn't have to say that much. I don't know if I ever had to say it, but I thought it and my eyes projected it. <laughs> and <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, but it happened quickly. It wasn't like I was, you know, sometimes people would start asking like, Mike, I just could never do that. You know, like you were born with some superpower. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. It was training, you know? We can train ourselves to do stuff that, we never thought we could do. And I didn't train myself. Somebody, you know, there was an 85-year-old speech therapist, guy named Richard Ham, Dr. Richard Ham at Florida State. I'm, I'm sure he's long deceased now because that was, you know, 25 years ago. But uh really did change everything for me. See, and what you are talking about, I mean, that's my life. Had I had I not read that book by Mel Robbins. Mm -hmm. That fear, I mean, it is crippling. That fear is so powerful. It made me change my major in college from pre-law to psychology because I wanted to be a lawyer because I love to argue. I'm Latino. It's what we do. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> I love to argue. And so that was my goal. I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I watched that movie, My Cousin Vinny. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. 
And that. one of the attorneys, the older gentleman, they were in a courtroom and the judge was ready for their I'm opening remarks. And and this gentleman, you know, he walked up, I mean, just calm and cool and collected. He walked over to the jury box and then I heard it. I thought, I mean, every he had a severe stutter and he was sputtering and spitting on the on the um, jury by accident and their mouths were open and their eyes were big. And so I thought, that's not going to be me. That is not going to be me. And that fear, you know, that happened over the weekend on Monday morning, I changed from pre-law to, you know, psychology. And so now I just help people in a different way. But I mean, had, I mean, had I read her book during that time period, Ooh, I would have been an awesome attorney, but you know, um, everything happens for a reason, I believe. And so here we are. Yeah, man. Yeah, I hear it. It's, um, you're right. That fear is, uh, it can be very crippling. And, and I would hope that the way that young people that stutter that are coming up are now, well, I hope there's a lot more awareness of what to do had to talk about stuttering with young people than there was when we were growing up. Because when we were growing up, it was, you know, I don't know. Nobody ever told me to fully just accept it and go tell people about it and to, to switch the mindset to one of excitement rather than just pure dread. Those are all things that kind of had to stumble upon over time and, and, you know, have those light bulb moments that go off eventually. But, it sure would help the next generation or the current growing up generation of kids that stutter if if they were getting these messages. So hopefully they're uh, all going to tune into this podcast for us, Pedro. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And and that beautifully leads us into this next amazing and powerful question. So what advice would you give to another person who stutters? So the biggest one is to not shut yourself up, to say what you want to say. I mean, yes, we we might not get to everything that we have to say because there's only so many hours in the day and it can take us a while. But if you want to say something, say it. It's okay to stutter. Tell people that you stutter. Um, I'm a big fan of the learning to look people in the eye. Like I said, we can go out and practice that. You could even, like, you don't even need a speech therapist to do that. Just bring out a friend. I mean, this would be one way to do it. And say, hey, come to the mall with me. I'm going to speak with 100 strangers today. You can do that in a few hours. Every time I look away when I'm stuttering, please remind me to look them in the eye. And do that for several sessions. And you can definitely learn to look people in the eye. It's just a habit that can be developed. And that's a powerful thing. And... Yeah, just basically just be totally open and honest with the world about it and say what you have to say. Um, From a technical standpoint, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, learning a technique that teaches you to control your breath, especially under pressure. And this happens with fluent people, too. When, When people get under stress and pressure, their breathing tends to become erratic and shallow. So if we can become really good at controlling our breath, and that leads to more basically poise and relaxation in those moments that are most difficult. Uh, so on the physical side, I think controlling the breathing is very important. But on the psychological behavioral side, just just don't hold back. Just go out there and be, be determined to be yourself. Whether you like the sound of your stutter or not, speak if you want to speak. You know, it reminds me of an Oasis song. Uh, was it um, dance if you want to dance, please, brother, take a chance. So that's my lousy voice interpretation. But, but you know, if, if, if you want to say something, say it. Don't let stuttering stop you. And, you know, sometimes you might not feel like struggling through the words and that's not the end of the world. To, you know, you don't have to go out there and, and totally exhaust yourself. But, but don't hide stuttering from people. If somebody meets you 
you know, and they're around you for any period of time and you, you know, have a, have a stutter, uh, they should leave that interaction knowing that you stutter. Whether it's just because you were willing to show them or because you told them, don't hide it. Because hiding it is what builds up even more pressure and makes us not be ourselves in this world, which is the biggest, perhaps one of the biggest tragedies that any person can have in their life is not to really be themselves. Wow. That's powerful, Mike. That's awesome, awesome um, advice. And while you were talking, I was taking notes because <laughs> I mean, that was <laughs> that was awesome. And so I want to uh, thank you, Mike, for for spending your time with me today and sharing your story, because I always believe that there's healing in sharing. So I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this has been a fantastic, awesome conversation. And so I wanted to also um, ask you, because I have awesome listeners, they are global. And so w w what if they want to reach out to you? How would they do that? Yeah, so, um, so I have a YouTube, I mean, if you want to call it a channel, I've got four videos up there where I talk about uh, different aspects of, of stuttering. They're all less than 10 minutes, I think. Uh, there's a video up there that's an example of uh, what my speech was like from age 18 to 41. But um, if you if you go to YouTube, you can Google uh, or you can type in there uh, Mike Wilson stuttering and I should come up. Um, if people uh, wanted to email me, they could also email me. That's MPW as in Michael Patrick Wilson. So mpw219 at gmail.com. So that's another way. And I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to people. I like speaking to or, you know, just texting, whatever, interacting w with people that stutter. I think it's a, uh, I think, well, that's another to expand on that last question you asked. Getting to know other people that stutter, whether it's going to support groups through the Stuttering Association or just people that you meet online. However, interacting and being around other people that stutter is very beneficial for the person that stutters psychology because this is a very isolating condition. We've probably all felt that where we felt like we were the only person on the planet that was dealing with this and that runs deep. And so you know, make friends with people who stutter and to talk about it. It's a, it's actually, it's not just a, a tyrant. It's actually a very fascinating co condition, very interesting. And so people can feel free to reach out to me if they w want to talk more. How cool. Thank you, sir. Um, I will have those links in the podcast show notes that way. They can just click on it and go directly to your YouTube channel and then directly send you an, an um, email. And so I want to thank you one more time because this was a fantastic, awesome conversation. I think you are hashtag courageous. You're hashtag awesome. You are just phenomenal. And so I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And and I hope I hope that this is not the last time because, I mean, I'm pretty sure you and I can just spend a whole hour just on eye contact so, yeah, down the road. Well, I'll, yeah, <laughs> let's definitely t talk again. And I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you as well, Pedro. And it's a g good show that you're running. I'm, uh, you know, I've listened to several of the episodes and it's a good thing that you're doing. And it took courage on your end to d do this podcast, no doubt. And, and you're, you're, uh, you've brought it to fruition in an impressive way. So job well done. I'm sure many of your listeners f feel the same way. Thank you, sir. And, and so, um, so I hope you have a great afternoon and down the road, I know we will talk again. So you take care and be well. Sounds good, my friend. Bye. 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 Take care. If you like this podcast, head on over to Apple podcasts, subscribe, rate, and review. Thank you for listening, and we will talk again.